most of the religions that you've heard of today have a global reach. The religions most commonly referred to as the Big Five are Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And while there was once a time where these Big Five religions were only located in one geographical part of the world, our world has expanded to the point where it is almost impossible to live somewhere, work somewhere, or study somewhere where there isn't someone who worships differently from you. Now, there is sometimes a problem. People don't really know how to go about this, this diversity. They're scared that they'll say the wrong thing or something like that. So I decided to come here and talk about the theology of difference with you guys today and how we can have better interfaith dialogue. The inspiration for my talk comes from a very beloved figure here on Bellarmine's uh, campus, and that is Thomas Merton. He has written a lot of things, but one of my favorite works by him is Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander. In this book, Thomas Merton discusses this idea of the law of love. Now, this law is not to just be found in genuine, like, genuine gestures of niceness or anything like that, but it's to be seen in genuine interaction with one another, seeing each other as a brother or sister united in a common humanity, sitting down with people that are different from us who may even be seen as our adversaries sometimes. A big part of this law of love comes from Pope John the 23rd that you see right there. He came up with this, well, he didn't come up with Socratic dialogue, but it was a big part of his whole thing with Vatican II. Now, I believe there are three paths, well, two paths that are most commonly done when it comes to interfaith dialogue. The similarities, the differences, and the third part that I'm gonna strongly advocate for you all here today, the theology of difference, so let's jump into it. The path of similarities is something I see very often as a student of theology and world religion. Usually, you can tell it's a path of similarity when they say, we all go to the same place in the end, or it's all the same religion, there's just different names. While I do believe people do not have bad intentions when they say this, this is one of the most damaging and ineffective things that we can do to a community. They believe this because they think it avoids conflict, and it, they think it brings a false peace. Because, oh, you know what? If we all agree on the same thing, we can't argue, right? And this does bring a false peace, I argue, because it's only touching the surface, not seeing what's underneath. And this can really hurt many people in a community. They have a negative view of difference, which I believe should not you know, always be the case, and they have two big problems. They see sameness as equaling value, in the idea that, okay, um, the only reason you can sit at my table is because you're similar to me. That's the only way I'm gonna be able to really interact with you. Now, I don't believe people do this like at all. Like I said, not a bad intention. But this is what's happening subconsciously sometimes. And they have the wrong definition of unity, seeing it as an underlying sameness. Now, path two is about the differences. This is kind of a path that's a little bit more antagonistic. It ultimately sees people as other. Um, and something I commonly hear when people talk about this is, you know what, they can't even get along within themselves in their own denominations. How can I get along with them with a religion that's coming from left field? This is fueled by misinformation, sometimes inspired by conversion, and ultimately fear-driven. Merton had some very pivotal words on this. He once wrote that if he denies all that is Muslim, Buddhist, Jewish, and so forth, then there is nothing for him to confirm himself as a Catholic, and certainly no breath of the Spirit to do so. That's what's really going on here. If we can only define ourselves by what we are not, we're not defining our true selves. If I said, I'm Kayla because I'm not this, this, and this, I'm not defining myself. When I say, I am Kayla because I am this, this, and this, that's where we really get going on common ground. Now, path three, the path that I am strongly advocating for you all here today, is the theology of difference. This is the only path I believe that fully embraces the law of love, and that you're coming to the table with someone who is different from you, but you see them as a brother or a sister, united in a common humanity. This is very important. Um, it has the correct definition of unity, because this unity has an underlying concept of diversity in it, this difference. It looks at our similarities, but it also embraces the difference as both being something that's so equally important. It has a full and total Socratic dialogue where we sit down not with the intention to fight or to convert, but to genuinely get to know each other with an openness and respect. And it comes to the conclusion of there's no them but only us. Now, I know what some of you all are thinking. Kayla, that sounds just like the similarities path. What's going on here? Um, it's not, because um, I argue that in the similarities path, we're only looking at similarities. We push difference out the window because we're scared of it. But in this path, we're looking at the difference, we're looking at the similarity, we're marrying them together and see them both as equally as important. 
But this path is not a path that's usually taken. The first two paths that I discussed were the, you know, the big ones because they're so easy. You can do them in a snap of a finger and go to bed and sleep well that night. Um, this path requires two major things. It requires a steady ground and an openness. Now, by steady ground, I mean steady ground in our own tradition. Now, I'm not saying that you have to be an expert in your religion. I'm a Protestant, I have been my whole life, and I'm a theology student. And I want to say that after you know, declaring theology as a major and having all these classes since sophomore year, I have more questions than answers. But if we're able to come together not feeling threatened, because when people ask you a question about your tradition, don't think, oh man, they don't believe it, I've got to lash out, that fight or flight response. They're genuinely wanting to know because they're coming from a similar aspect of respect. And we can't be afraid to go, you know what, buddy, <laughs> I have no idea. But here's my theology behind it. Let's, what do you think? What, what would your tradition say? Things like that. And openness, fully coming together, fully open to the table. Now, this sounds kind of scary because a lot of us can't, you know, do openness with significant others or even close friends, let alone a stranger at a table. But if we both come to this table together, both understanding that they are coming from a level of respect as much as you are, we can really get together. To wrap this up, Thomas Merton once said that the beginning of love is to let those we love be perfectly themselves and not to twist them to fit our own image. Otherwise, we love only the reflection of ourselves we find in them. This is a challenge to myself and everyone watching and listening to this. If we are only able to get along by looking only at the reflection, or maybe putting on blinders to not see that reflection, we're going to get nowhere. Our community won't thrive. There will be more hurt feelings than good feelings. So when we look into this, we need to realize that we're both coming from a standard point of common humanity. And what I really want to drive home tonight is that it's okay to look in the past for wisdom. Merton is from the, uh, the past, but his wisdom can impact our present and bring flourishing to our future. Thank you.